This is not the presentation, which will be interesting, but it is the Q&A time. Uh, that's the time where we can ask the most questions that we've been thinking about. Why do they do this? Or why can't I get this? Or, or what's the challenge here? Uh, and, and Chris is the man that knows the answers. So, so with that, let me introduce Chris, uh, Percy, and, and come up and have the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. So they're recording. I'm going to walk up here and be up here if you don't mind. I'm just going to unlock my iPad. We have plenty of security at AT&T, so these time out regularly. So I'm just going to unlock so I don't have to look back at the screen and I can look at my presentation. So great. Well, thank you for, for having me. It's been a really crazy last few days. We had a small event on Friday, the iPhone 6 and the 6 Plus launch. Anybody get one? Anybody get a new one yet? Not yet. Not yet. Well, Ricky Baker is our new store manager in the Paducah store. He was up in Murray, and we just promoted Ricky. So congratulations to Ricky Baker. He's a new store manager here in Paducah. So we're so come see Ricky. He's going to take great care of him and his team. We, uh, it was an amazing launch. Um, the iPhone 6 demand was, you've probably read it, uh, it was pretty phenomenal what we've seen in the industry. You know, Apple is pretty amazing at creating demand. And uh, I'm very impressed with this device. This is the 6. Obviously, the 6 Plus is 5.5 inches. This is 4.7. But uh, we had a really, really amazing weekend. Uh, typically, we run out of inventory in a very short period. This year, Apple was able to deliver quite a few devices. And Ricky and his team can tell you we were in our store till 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night on Friday, and then we had additional lines on Saturday, and quite a few, um, and worked all day, and we even have inventory Sunday and Monday. Usually there's a shorter amount, but it was really, really exciting. And, you know, this is our eighth iPhone launch. I remember the very first one, and everyone continues to get better, and these devices get better, and I'll talk about that, but I just wanted to comment on the iPhone 6 because it's so relevant in our business right now, what's happening in mobility, and Apple's really on the forefront of the technology. So what I want to talk to you about is, is, is you know, Sim asked me to come up and talk. Our industry is changing every other industry out there. We are really revolutionizing, you know, how we do commerce. And, you know, we love being at the center of that. It used to be we were the dumb pipe, right? We were the, you know, bringing that dumb pipe. Well, now everything is going mobile. In 2007, we got a new chairman. His name is Randall Stevenson. He is the head of the Business Roundtable out of Washington, D.C., so he's also an industry leader in all industries. But he came out in 2007 and said, we are a mobility company. And back in 2007, you know, SimWork came, grew up in the landline side. He was like, you know, all the landline team was like, what? What do you mean we're a mobility company? No, we're a network organization, right? We're a plant organization. And it's really interesting how that vision has come to play. And what I'm going to talk to you about is, is how the wireless industry, not only is it revolutioning our society, but it is, you know, quickly, you know, the rapid pace that we're moving at is amazing. So I'm going to talk to you about 2014 and where we see it going by 2020. And it's only six years away, but it's amazing the step function improvement we're getting to. So our goal is pretty simple. We want to mobilize your world. And I'm going to step back and give you kind of a little bit of a history of wireless, and then I'll kind of go forward if I could. So if you look at the product life cycle, right, introduction, growth, maturity, and then decline, we have four waves is the way we like to look at it. The first wave was voice. When wireless first came out, it was a mobile device used as a business productivity tool, and it was mainly you know, $1,000 phone bills for business uh, executives that were calling for productivity, right? It was used on the highways. That's where we built the network, and that was really the growth right, of our business when it launched, and it exploded. Um, that business is now has matured, and it is on decline. Right, it is now a, a revenue declining business. The second wave was text messaging. Remember when text messaging came out? That was a huge growth business for us, a different way of communicating. 
right? I think all of us can now attest to, you know, it is more efficient for us to text than it is sometimes to call because you don't have to do all the niceties. Hey, how are you? You can really get quick information and there's all types of applications of how you can do it. Even broadcast, if you need to get emergency information out or to communicate, you see it in marketing. So that really revolutionized you know, how we you know, interact with each other. Again, hit a huge growth, it matured and it is now also on a revenue declining business, especially with the you know, advent of all these applications that use data that you can do text messaging using data like iMessage, right? Anybody use iMessage, right? So that is now over data. It's no longer an SMS or a short messaging service. It's actually data that is you know, used on the data network. So the third wave of the business is data, right? It's all about data. You see all of uh, the carriers, the plans are all about buying a bucket of minutes. It's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and it's really about the data. And that's really where the growth is in our business today. And you're seeing that growth uh, really expand, especially you know, with the advent of people consuming most of their data via video. And if you look on just the normal broadband, the majority of the usage in broadband is YouTube, right, or Netflix. Those are the two biggest demands on a, on a landline-based broadband system. And so we're seeing that same explosion on the mobile network. And we believe, our CEO has come out and says, we are going to be a video company. And it, you probably have read, we have gone out and we are in process of trying to acquire DirecTV. And the synergy of having a mobile business with a video business, in addition to our existing landline business, um, creates a lot of synergies that allow us to bundle and offer solutions to our customers. So again, that third wave is data and that is really exploding. Um, especially with the advent of all the applications of social media with Instagram and Snapchat and you know, Twitter and all of that, it's really exploding. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the fourth wave. You know, we're a $125, $127 billion company annual revenue. As you know, we're a for-profit company. You have to grow. The, you know, Wall Street expects you, you got to grow. And so how do you grow? Well, typically you need to grow 4 to 5% a year. So if you grow 4 to 5% a year on a $125 billion company, that's about $5 billion a year in growth that you have to go get. That is, you know, like going to, you know, $5 billion a year growth. That's a lot of money to grow every year. And so what we're out there doing is trying to understand where is that fourth wave coming from and that's what I'm going to talk to you about here. So if you look at today on smartphones, you know, today the processor, if you go back and look at it, the processor of yesterday was 200 megahertz. Today the processor is 6.8 gigahertz on a device like this, right? Tiny little device has a 6.8 gigahertz processor. Really fast, right? Storage, 64 megabytes just a few years ago. This device right here is 128 gigabytes. Apple iPhone 6, right? I know on my screen it says 64, but this is the first smartphone that's come out with 128 gigs of you know, onboard storage. Pretty amazing. Network speed, when we launched it was Edge, 135 kilobytes, right? Snail mail, right? Today, on our 4G LTE network, we see anywhere from 5 to 12, and even north, you know, Ricky will tell you, he hasn't seen a speed here in Paducah less than 20 gigabytes, and he sees them up to 40, or sorry, 40 megabytes of, of download speeds. Really, really fast on a wireless device. You remember when we launched a T1? It was 1.5 megabits. One T1 is 1.5 megabits. Now, you can get 6, 10, 12, even 20 megabytes of speed on a wireless device. And it really changes how we're going to you know, conduct commerce, how we're going to interact with each other. It's mobilizing everything. So from our perspective, if it has a power button, we want to connect it to the internet. So if you look out into 2020, what's going to happen to the processors? So again, 6.8 gigahertz. We think these devices are going to go to 215 gigahertz. I mean, that's really mind-boggling just in the next six years what you're going to be able to, to do on a device. Storage, 64 terabytes. 
Could you imagine 64 terabytes on a smartphone? And then from a speed perspective, half a gig. 500 megabits on a device. Now a lot has to happen in order for that to be created with spectrum and with you know software and and with you know land based networks but it's pretty amazing to think about what you can do you know to mobilize your world with those type of devices and speeds. So let's talk about um, some of the things that that have to happen. With LTE it really brings down the latency and that's the biggest thing of how fast the network can talk to each other and that's the difference in the data speeds. Latency is, as you all know, managing land-based or land networks, latency is the key. Cloud computing. So everything's going to be up in the cloud, right? With iCloud, everything is going to be stored up in, up in the cloud and then you can touch it really fast. Twinning. Has anybody ever heard of twinning, what twinning is? So it's really the next phase that you're going to see and it's like having a wearable like this phone or this uh, watch. And basically what this watch is, is it twins with a device, say it be your smartphone, and it basically takes on the characteristics of your smartphone. So some of the applications may be if, is, is this watch, if I want to go for a run, will now be my phone. And so it basically mirrors the device. I can go for a run without my phone, be the same phone number, and I can do a majority of the things that I need to do on my device. The next one is biometrics, and that one's very similar with wearables. We believe wearables are going to be a very big solution and a, and a product that's going to explode. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit of it, but it's really going to integrate into the ecosystems, which I think is what really makes it take off. So that'll allow you to you know, monitor your health, whether it be your heart rate, your blood pressure, you know, how much you've walked in a day, you know, different things, what's your temperature, and really allow you to, to you know, manage your overall health. So all this from a smartphone. So the smartphone really is the remote control of your life. And that's how we classify it. This is the remote control of your life. If you think about it, when you leave your house, you have a smartphone, you have your keys, and you have your wallet. Well, our goal is to eliminate the need to, for you to have a key or to have a wallet. Or even to have a badge when you come into your work. A lot of people have a badge that you have to click in to come in. You know, over time, we think that's all going to be done on your smartphone. And so this really is, to a lot of people, it's your identity, right? You really. Uh, interact with everything, your social network, uh, you know, how you consume and use data, it's going to manage your, your, your health. What we're doing is how do we go find that fourth wave knowing that this is the center of your universe and how do we provide solutions off of that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of these and show you that so the first one is, is going to be connected home and business. And so we believe this is a huge opportunity to connect your home and business with your smartphone. And so what we've done is we've launched a business called Digital Life. And what basically Digital Life is, is we're going after the security business, but we're going to change it. It's not really going to be security. It's truly home automation. And so basically what it is, is it's wireless based. We'll come in and install a, a uh, unit inside your house that interacts with the wireless network uses Wi-Fi within your house to allow you to connect to your thermostats. It'll allow you to connect to door locks that you can put on your doors. You can open and unlock your doors. It'll allow you to have sensors on your garage doors. It'll allow you to open and close your garage doors. It'll allow you to have cameras. It'll allow you to turn on and off your lights. Um, and it'll also allow you to monitor your water in case you had a water main break or have a water leak in your house and you're on vacation in Belize, you can turn it off. Um, so it's really powerful. I'll share a couple examples of how I use digital life in my life. I've got four kids. Um, my second child is a daughter. She's 15. And she's at that age where she's trying to uh, use my wife's clothing. And so we put one of the door locks on my wife's closet. And the day we installed it, my 15-year-old walks in and says, Mom, can I borrow those shoes? And my wife looks at me and she goes, I love digital life. Because she would never ask before. She'd just sneak in the back door and she'd grab those shoes. Now she has to come over and ask for permission. 
The other thing I like about it is, is you can lock all the valuables in that closet. Say your house is being cleaned, or you're gonna have somebody in your house. There's an extra layer of protection for valuables. Uh, another solution that I saw is you can set up alarms on your device that will send you a text message when things happen. So I set up an alarm for my 17 year old son, almost 18, senior in high school, that every time his garage door opens it sends me a text message. So then I know what time he gets home. Now they don't like this very much, but from my perspective, since I'm paying the bills, I like it a lot. I'll give you another solution. I'm at dinner with my wife, and, I, and I'm looking at the Digital Life app, and I see that our kitchen door had opened about 15 or 20 times in the matter of about five minutes, because it tells you when it opened and closed and opened and closed because of the sensor connecting with Wi-Fi in your house and then over the wireless network. I hit an app on my phone, so I called my son. I said, who's at your, our house right now? And he's like, uh, what do you mean? I said, well, the door opened about 20 times. And, you know, I'm coming home right now. There's no parties at our house, right? So the other thing is you're on vacation. You can adjust your thermostat. So I can turn down the thermostat, you know, so that I'm not wasting money on energy, right? We've figured you can save 30% on your energy costs by using digital life. You're also are going to save money on your uh, insurance, your home insurance, up to 20% because if you have a monitored home, insurance companies will give you a discount. It's just it, the automation to know what's going on inside your home, wherever you are in the world, all you have to do is have internet access. So you can access it on your smartphone, your tablet, anywhere you can get internet access. You know what's going on inside your home. Some people, especially if you have dog lovers, they have a camera. They want to know what Fido's doing during the day. Or whether there's a nanny, right? Somebody has a child at home, they can see via, via camera. You can also set it up on your front porch. Somebody rings your doorbell, it'll send you a text message with a picture of the person that just rang your doorbell. So this is a huge business. It's about an $18 billion annual revenue with really only one carrier that, or one provider out there that's pretty fragmented. It's ADT. You know, we can integrate this and make it really simple for you on a, smart, on a smartphone and we can bundle it together. It's a huge opportunity. The next phase for us is we're going to go into the business side of that security. So then you can really go into you know, managing that asset uh, to know, especially for small businesses, you, know, you can have remote access to know what's going on in your warehouse. You, know, you can be a, a, you know, a business owner and you can go look at your dry cleaner or you can look at the warehouse and you can see what's happening in a moment's notice anywhere. We've also, you know, this product was developed and we've also licensed it to other companies you know, around the world to take this application. Truly the first all IP, all digital security solution in home, soon to go into business. So this is a huge fourth wave. We're the first company to sell home automation in a retail store. So we haven't launched here in Paducah or Murray yet, but in Louisville and, and Nashville and Memphis and Knoxville, which I'm responsible for, we have this in, in about 37 of our 71 stores today. So the next phase is digital life can also, we can couple that with care of our loved ones as they age, right? Just imagine the applications that can be built from a medical perspective that will allow you to, you know, take care of a, an elderly, you know, parent or relative. So that's coming out, you know, they just did the rules uh, on that, the FCC did, and that's 600, basically the, the TV stations have to, broadcast stations, they have to opt in. They own that spectrum, it was given to them, they own that spectrum and they have to say, hey, we, we can relinquish this. Now a lot of that spectrum was used when we had rabbit ears on top of our homes and that's how we got TV content. Well, we all know that's now either satellite or it's coming through cable, um, you know, or IPTV. And so the biggest natural resource in the wireless business is spectrum. You got to have spectrum in, in order to, you know, handle the demand of the capacity that's coming at us. And so the 600 band is low band is what they call it. There's low band and high band. When wireless first came out, Judge Green broke up AT&T, you know, the first AT&T he broke up in 1984. There basically there was 50 megahertz of 850 spectrum. 
One was given to the B carrier, which was all the R box. They automatically got 25 megahertz of 850 spectrum. The other 25 went to, um, to an auction. And there was a guy named Craig McCall that went out and bought a bunch of this spectrum, right? And then it all kind of came together. And so the 850 low band spectrum, which is predominantly today, AT&T and Verizon own those spectrums after all the acquisitions kind of settled. That is called low band, very, very rich spectrum. 1900 spectrum is what T-Mobile and Sprint came out and built their networks on because there was no more 850 spectrum. That's called high band spectrum, 1900. The difference in the two spectrums is it takes about 2.5 1900 towers to equal one 850 tower. Just the law of physics, because of the band wave, an 850 spectrum penetrates buildings and can travel a longer distance. That's just kind of physics. The 600 is below 800. It's a better, it's still low band. That's really rich spectrum. When we launched LTE nationwide, we launched it on a 700 in most areas where we had the spectrum. We launched our brand new, you know, unencumbered network on 700 megahertz. Again, low, uh, low, bra, you know, low spectrum. We also have 2100 spectrum. Uh, we call AWS and we have some 2300 as well. And so there's low band and high band. We really want this 600. We're going to have to have it because at some point we're going to reach a capacity need for this spectrum. What's happening today and what you hear about LTE Advantage. And what LTE Advantage is, it allows you to do carrier aggregation. And so it allows you to take multiple different spectrum bands and aggregate them together to give you better speed and capacity and spectrum utilization. So today, we use on our LTE network, where we have 700, we have 700, and then we have to put a second carrier, they call it, and we'll either use 1900 or 2100. And so what happens is when you do that, if you have a device, like the iPhone 6 or the Samsung Galaxy 5, they have carrier aggregation that allows you to use all the spectrum in that band as long as you have the right firmware, right, you know, in the network, but allows you to aggregate that spectrum and to give you increased speeds and capacity. So that 600 band spectrum is very important. You've probably read T-Mobile saying, hey, we want to buy more 700 spectrum. They want that 700 spectrum because you put 700 spectrum on a 1900 grid, it works really well. In my market in, in Knoxville, we have 1900 spectrum. We had that same benefit. We had 1900, you put 700 on that, you get really good in-building coverage. The other thing that LTE Advantage does for you is it, it does what we call VOLTE, Voice Over LTE. And what Voice Over LTE will allow you to do is truly use the data network and kind of do VoIP, what you do in the business or, or home side. We're going to do Voice Over LTE, Voice Over our data network. And rather than being a circuit switch call, it'll actually be a data session. And, you know, it is... Um, very efficient. The other thing it'll do if you have Volte talking to a Volte device, both wireless, both on Volte, you have HD quality. And so it truly is, is you could be driving down the road with your window down and nobody would hear any of that wind noise. You could be at a game in a stadium and you know it's loud around you and you wouldn't be able to hear all that background noise. You could be at a concert or and so that HD quality really um, you know is the second application on that. So I don't know if I answered that question, but yes. I was wondering when that might It's 2015, 2016 timeline. We have um, you know, set aside money and we will be an active participant in the 600 band spectrum auctions. Follow on on my question. Um, your first slide you talked about moving from Five megabits where we are now, uh, 2020 to 500 to Even with the 600 spectrum, you're also changing with this model the amount of traffic that you had ongoing and regular. It's a lot more service. How do you plan the perspective? Yeah, so. You know, the question is with, you know, you saw the theoretical speeds of getting to a half a gig or 500 megabit speeds, you know, with all the capacity, you know, increases that are forecasted with video usage on our networks, how do we plan to get there? Well, we used to manage our networks where it is all about switches, right? We got to put more equipment out there. 
Well, what we're learning is, is you can't, we keep chasing that, you know, that run rate of putting in more switches and more routers. And what we've come back to is saying, you know, we got to use software more efficiently to manage the network to be more efficient on the capacity. So this all entails that we believe that the, the switching is going to get better over the next six years, but more importantly the software is really going to, the firmware is going to drive a lot of the, the um, aggregation of the spectrum and the ability to manage capacity better. You know, most of our cell sites are all fiber fed. At some point your cell site you know, on your call is going to go to a cell site and from that cell site it's all land based. You know, here in our market we're 95 percent of our cell sites are all fiber fed. So the limitation is not going to be you know, on the fiber. The limitation is going to be on spectrum on the towers, how many towers you have, how many sectors you have on that. You know, those are the biggest challenges. What we've done is gone out and we've had to go put in new antennas on all of our sites and a lot of times when you put on new antennas they're the eight foot antennas. Um, we have to go do new structurals on these into these towers because when you go from a four to an eight foot antenna and there may be three carriers on one structure so there's a lot of work that has been done. We just crossed 300 million pops covered in 4G LTE. So over the last three years we've been doing a ton of work to upgrade the antennas on, this, on the network, to you know, upgrade our switching equipment to make sure that you know, it's all consistent, but most importantly it's that firmware. It's the software that is probably the biggest demand that AT&T has. AT&T would tell you what employee do we need in the future. It is those people that can write code and understand algorithms that are going to help us efficiently use our spectrum to handle capacity. And how do we manage our networks from a software perspective and be less reliant on hardware? And that is a fundamental cultural shift inside our business. John Stanky, who's our chief strategy officer, would tell you that is our number one core competency that we need in new employees coming into AT&T. We need software engineers that are going to come in and help us with that complex equation. So I didn't hear it. Software engineers what? Are you, is your perfect employee coming through the door for that? A software engineer with a background or networking person with software? Yeah, I think it's both. Somebody that understands networking, somebody understands RF, somebody understands software and that can help us manage massive amounts of data. You know, and it's somebody that's going to sit in a room and, and be really, you know, that loves that analytical that can come in and write code to solve complex problems. You know, I don't, you know, you know, I'm not managing that side of the business. John Donovan manages network and it's under him who works for Randall Stevenson. But I would just tell you that's what John and those guys are focused on is how do we go to software 2.0 or network 2.0. And network 2.0 is it really de-emphasizes hardware and emphasizes software so that I can sit remotely and manage my network rather than every time I want to go upgrade my network I got to go touch a piece of equipment. And so I would say yes. Great question. Please. So with all of these other wireless what is AT&T's plan to make it more secure? So the question was, you know, what's AT&T doing on the security side? You know, we are very proud of, you know, our legacy and integrity and in security. I think we do a very good job not only managing the privacy of our customers um, but you know and their data but you know we chose a long time ago to move from TDMA to GSM. GSM has proven to be you know the most secure wireless connectivity that you can get. Um, you know we are investing heavily in cloud and security is a big piece of that. You know, CIOs across the country, and we touch all 1,000, Fortune 1,000 companies we do business with, and that's the number one question that they ask is security, security, security. 
and we get that question. They come to us all the time. Hey, we're getting hit by cyber attacks that are trying to break our firewall and get you know at our data. It is the number one. I'm not the right one to ask on security. I can tell you about mobility. You know, the good news is is you know on our side the encryption is there, but the challenge that you face is is as a smartphone user is what data are you allowing people to see? We're not making the decision you do because you download an app, you give permissions, you do things that can jeopardize your own security. We've encrypted it on our side. Typically it's on the software side or the app side that allows people to get you know, to your device. So you just have to you know, be cautious about you know, what permissions you grant people when you download apps and or software to your devices. On the business side with security, you know, if you have specific needs, I can find you know, my peer who can you know, talk to you on the security side on business applications. Um, I'm not the guy for that. You know, our business has changed. My CEO is a guy named Ralph De La Vega, um, just a phenomenal operator. He reports to Randall. He has the mobility unit. He just got a promotion and he now has business and mobility. So he now just basically pulled in mobility and so they hired a new CEO of Just Mobility. His name is Glenn Lurie, uh, who I report to now. And Ralph now has business as well as mobility. So I know they're integrating those two things because uh, of all of the business customers, you know, have the same question. How are you going to protect my business and the security? Because all businesses are going mobile and how they're managing stuff, right? With tablets and smartphones and, you know, connected devices. You know, it is, you know, every CIO's living and waking, you know, problem. And we're, you know, we have experts that can help you. You know, we have a lot of bright people and we're giving some pretty good advice to business customers. There's a lot of talk nowadays about net neutrality. Yep. And uh, where are you going? Well, it's really simple to us, right? So uh, from our perspective, we've invested over the last five years $109 billion, okay? $109 billion that AT&T has invested in our networks. Right, so that we can provide service to our customers. Right? We have invested more money than any company in America from a capital perspective. This is equipment in the ground. This is not expense, this is not employees, this is capital investment. Capital investment creates jobs. Do you guys agree with that? As the number one indicator of jobs is capital investment. So people that are on the opposite side of net neutrality would tell you it should be open and free. Right? Well, we invested $109 billion. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we believe we can get a return on that investment. It shouldn't be open and free because it wasn't free to create. You know, so from our perspective, you know, we will live by net neutrality rules that are, have been in place from the Telecommunications Act. We, we agree with those. Right? We don't, we're, we're saying, okay, as they stand today, fine. The new net neutrality that they're trying to open, it's open an internet, and, you know. Hey, there are some applications, like Netflix, like YouTube, that take a lot of data to transmit. And so they take the lion's share. Should that data be treated the same as this one over here that may be encumbered by the amount of data this one has done? So there's limited amount of capacity. And so you have to be able to manage your network so that it doesn't affect all of your customers. That's all we're saying. And so as long as you know, we want the ability to have a return on investment, you know, we want it, you know, we're going to work with regulators on it to get good policy because it's really going to come down to investment. Because who's investing in that backbone? You know, there are companies out there that use the backbone as a way to monetize and make money, but they don't have any investment in that backbone. And so it's really easy for them to say, hey, it should be open and free. Um, we can take that offline, but that's not my understanding. No. That's not my understanding. Sounds like that was a lot of people's questions.